recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff. This is Triviality. The cream of the crop. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Triviality, the game where a lack of seriousness meets a little bit of knowledge. My name's Ken, and I am blessed today to have Neil and Jeff in the studio with me. How are you guys doing? Hey, I'm doing all right. Uh, blessed to be here. Hashtag blessed, guys. Hashtag blessed. YOLO. I, I can't even take it today. <laughs> Hashtag wanderlust. Where are we going? Uh, what, what does that mean? You know, wanderlust. Oh, like, like if you're doing like a like a tree pose on the top of a canyon or something? Yeah, like oh, okay. it, you're, you're, you're letting yourself out there to, to experience the, the world. I've seen a couple of those, I guess. Yeah, I've seen a lot of tattoos of wanderlust on the inner forearm of Instagram models. I thought yeah. my favorite song Be- by It Dies Today finally caught on. Or not It Dies Today, uh, Every Time I Die. Every Time I Die, <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of tattoos, there's there's been some controversy about your your alleged back tattoo, Neil. Oh, I hear, I hear, I heard that. Um, Matt apparently did a poll or something like that. Um, yeah, some people approached me and said they weren't sure if it was real or if we were joking. Oh, I don't know why anyone would assume I have a back tattoo. I'm, I'm like too middle ground vanilla. But I guess we'll nice see. Guy. We'll we'll see in the crop. If you want to find out the uh, the true answer is as to whether Neil's back tattoo is real or if we're joking, go to the crop and become a member of the crop. Yeah, we should also have a poll if I actually had a motorcycle for a year, but who knows about that one? Who knows? Neil is a man of mystery. I know. That's clear. I'm like the bad boy in a, a 70s sitcom where I'm not too bad, but I'm just bad enough. <laughs> we have another man of mystery uh, Skyping into us today. He's going to be today's host. It is Jared Seal from Alabama. How you doing? Great. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, and you're an NXT champion, so we certainly thank you for your support. Of course. Uh, Matt isn't here today. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the Chantix uh, commercials, uh, pharmaceutical commercials that have the, ones, a, the cool ones with Ray Liotta. Not the cool ones with Ray Liotta, but the ones with the CG turkey. Matt is actually out. Uh, he's actually starring in those, doing the motion capture for the turkey that's in the wilderness, uh, getting over his cigarette Hold addiction. On. So there's two sets of Chantix commercials. One of them is Ray Liotta and eyeliner, and the other one's a turkey. It's a CG turkey camping. <laughs> I haven't seen the turkey one. Oh yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. And uh, Matt is out there doing the motion capture with the uh, the avatar suit and whatnot. And uh, you know, we wish him luck, and hopefully he doesn't get addicted to cigarettes because they have a lot of them on set, even though it is an anti-cigarette commercial. So as we said, uh, Jared's going to be hosting today's game. But before uh, we get started in that, can you tell us a little bit about your life? Yeah, sure. I'm um, I'm from Alabama, born and raised, and I am a software engineer at a DoD contractor. Awesome. Uh, well, how did you uh, How did you find the show? I've always been a trivia fan. Um, ever since middle school, I was on my my quiz bowl team back then, and that was a lot of fun. So, got into a lot of different podcasts over the years and I just realized I'd never really found a trivia podcast that I liked and so I searched trivia on iTunes and yours was the first one that popped up. So uh, the algorithm. The algorithm. Working. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I really like the show. So I'm Thank glad you. to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah. And we're really excited to uh, play your game today. So without further ado, let's toss it to the rules guy. The rules of the game are simple. 20 questions split into two rounds worth 10 points apiece. At halftime, there'll be a special swing round designed by this week's host. After regulation, players will enter the final round with the points that they've accumulated and will have a chance to wager 0 to 30 points on five categorized questions. At the end of the game, someone will be named the cream of the crop. The cream of the crop! Okay, is everybody ready to get started? Yeah, I think we're doing a three-for-all, an old-school three-for-all. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, Neil, and Ken versus each other. Jeff, you ready? I am. Are you ready? Are you ready? But only on the condition that the winner is the only one who leaves this room. Fair. Okay. All right. I'm down with that. It's a cage match. Yeah, and I live here, so I guess I I don't have to leave the room. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Take it away, Jared. All right. uh, Question one. We're going to get things started off with a space question. Located about 2.5 million light years away from Earth, what major galaxy is the closest to the Milky Way? I am good here. Oh, man. We're going to let Neil think this, think this one through. Uh, the most, the biggest galaxy other than the Milky Way. Um, I think I know the name of a star. I don't know about the galaxy. Um, I, oh, no, isn't it like, um, I'm getting all the galaxies from like comic books and movies in my head, which I know are incorrect, but. It might not be. But it, it also might be. Yeah. The only thing that's coming to my head, and I think it's a star, and I feel like an idiot, it's probably the North Star, honestly. But I, I'm just going to lock in with Ursa Major. Okay. If I said Kevin Sorbo, 
What would you? Oh, is that the Sorbo Galaxy? Uh, it's Andromeda. Oh, no. I wanted to go with the 2000 to 2005 Gene Roddenberry show, Andromeda. Starring Kevin Sorbo. <laughs> Uh, yeah, located about 2.5 million light years away from us, Andromeda is our closest galactic neighbor. Andromeda is a spiral galaxy that's estimated to contain about a trillion stars, which is twice as many as our galaxy. Now, see, I have a strain in my back from answering that question correctly, and it's, I'm going to call it the Andromeda strain now. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Michael Crichton. So uh, Neil's feeling pretty insignificant now, like a speck of dust in the in the universe. Yeah, as Socrates said, we're all just dust in the wind. Socrates. All right, go ahead with question two. Uh, Question two. On the topic of spiral-shaped things, a piano player usually uses their left hand to play notes written on the staff containing which of the two common clefs? I'm locked in. Same. Locked in. All right. Neil? Uh, Thank God. uh, We're all musicians here. I'm going to go with the bass clef. Oh, see, I wrote bass, but... uh... (laughs) Take me to the river. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I put bass clef. Yeah, if, if you're using your left hand to play it, chances are you're playing notes next to the bass clef. Unless you're one of those fancy dueling piano guys and your hands are crossed over. Yeah, and uh, and uh, bachelor parties are tipping you to play their high school fight song at Howl at the Moon. Are you doing uh, two pianos side by side? Like, uh, who was that? Lady Gaga doing that? Yeah, she did two that. Two pianos? Yeah. I was like, it's not really harder than one piano, but... <laughs> it looks cooler. It looks cool. All right, question three. It's a hard life out there for bassists sometimes. John Deacon is probably the least well-known member of what rock band, one of the most famous of all time? I think I'm good here. I'm going to lock in. I might be wrong. But. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk it out, too. I'll let Jeff lock in before me. I'm pretty sure I know who it is. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a guess, a guess in. So I think, um, you know, initially when you think of famous bands, famous bass players, um, you know, John Paul Jones, Led Zeppelin, um, he's great. I believe John Deacon... Uh, he was in a movie and I can't remember if it was, maybe it was Tommy or something else, but he's an, no, no, that's Peter Elf's whistle. Is that the Who's? Darn it. Now I'm, <laughs> I thought John Deacon was the Who's bass player. That might be Peter Elf's whistle or whatever, however you say his name. Gr- oh, great. And whistle. And whistle. Thank you. Now I'm it's confused. A player. Now I'm confused. Um, shoot. Okay. I'm just going to go with the who because that's who I thought it was, but, and then I figured out it's not, but I'm locked in with the who. I know it wasn't the who, and I knew it wasn't the Beatles, and I knew it wasn't Pink Floyd, and I couldn't remember who played what in Zeppelin, so I just said Zeppelin. And I think I remember hearing that name in the Bohemian Rhapsody movie, so I went with Queen. Uh, Maybe best known for his iconic opening riff in Another One Bites the Dust, John Deacon was the bassist for Queen. But who is the guitarist for Rush? Does anybody remember? Alex Lifeson? Lifeson. Is that mm-hmm. right? Um, oh, uh, is May the guitarist for... Yeah, yeah, yeah. May is guitarist Brian for Queen. May. It's May. so funny because, you know, we saw Bohemian Rhapsody. I just saw Rocket Man last night, which I loved, but... Um, yeah, it looks good. I should have remembered because John Deacon is played by... Um, I can't remember his name right now, but the kid from Jurassic Park. Oh, John Deacon. Oh, in, in Bohemian Rhapsody. In Bohemian Rhapsody, Rhapsody right? yeah. He's uh, like the oh, only... yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. I, I like looked up the cast. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I guess apparently he's like best or really good friends with Rami Malek, like since they were kids. Huh. I just I just remember that one part where uh, where Fred, Freddie Mercury leaves the band for a while and he says, he left us. He left us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Question four. Some of Queen's most famous songs, like Somebody to Love and Bohemian Rhapsody, appear on their albums A Day at the Races and A Night at the Opera. These album titles are references to two 1930s films starring what family comedy act? I, I am locked in. See, I knew that one. I am locked in too. Family comedy act. Yeah, you're, you're a huge Kevin James fan. Ugh. <laughs> That's why you bought a Segway and you ride it around the studio. <laughs> no, I do that for other reasons. Mostly just to feel tall. It's the Triviality Family Comedy Hour. God, just imagine us on Family Feud. I auditioned for Family Feud with my family at one point. Holy That does not yeah. surprise me. And it, it would was be so good. <laughs> I thought we would have been really good. And we answered the questions correctly. But the thing was, the person who was there, they had like a hype man. And they, you ran through a, a fake, I don't know, category or whatever, like 100 things, blah, blah, blah. And there's all these families there. And they, every other second, were like, more energy, more energy. So it was insanity. 
every time we went up there, it was just more energy. And I was like, all right, Steve. All right, Steve. I got the answer, Steve. All right. I'm like, I, I was so beside myself. Was your like, brother there? He was there. And Holy he, and he, sh- he had to go, yeah, yeah, all right. I know the answer. And it was like, we were not ourselves. And just imagine any family that you know that is just, you know, times 10, like over the top. You had to be three times that energy. And I just couldn't do it. Like We felt like idiots. Wow. Yeah. And we didn't get on, obviously, but. Obviously. Because I would have the recording of this. Yes. Right. <laughs> but Jeff. Uh, I, I I don't know. So I uh, I know he has other famous family members. So I said Chaplin. Okay. Um, well, speaking of family feud, Steve Harvey was known for his mustache. And so was the leader of this family, uh, Groucho Marx. So he's the Marx Brothers. Yeah. You got Harpo and Nilo and Jeffo. And Oprah. And Oprah. <laughs> and I uh, said the Marx Brothers. Yeah. Uh, a Night at the Opera came out in 1935. And A Day at the Races came out in 1937, and they featured the Marx Brothers. Cool. Now, uh, Ken ruined my next question a little bit just then. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so you said Harpo, right? Yeah. All right. Question number five. Everyone knows Groucho and now Harpo, but can any of you name a single other Marx Brother by their stage name? I was, I was going to keep going and say say some more, but... But you I'm don't know I anymore. Didn't. I'm glad I said Nilo and uh, Jeffo instead. Or maybe you just don't know anymore. Don't I? Oh, I, I don't know. I'm locked in, though. You're locked in? Um, Ken's locked in? I'm going to lock in with Zappo. Zappo Marks. Zappo with an A. <laughs> yeah. Like the shoe company? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were close. Jeff, you want to go first? Yeah, I said Karl Marx. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the real comedian he was the, the least. He was the least funny Marx brother. Uh, I said Zappo. Uh, yeah, the other brothers from the same mother are Chico, Harpo, Gummo, and Zeppo, with an E. Yeah, my friend and, had uh, four rats, all named after the Marx Brothers. Oh, that's good. That's good. I like that name. And there was actually a sixth brother named Manfred, who passed away before his first birthday. Oh, that, he's the least funny Marx brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It is true. I mean, that could be, I mean, a lot of great comedy is the source of, or great comedy is uh comes from a source of tragedy so maybe that's what got them in the business speaking of sources of tragedy ken's bowling uh, a perfect game yeah i'm bowling a perfect game and uh you guys uh, this is the score recap but i don't know what your score is but i have 20 it's bad. i also have 20 it's bad it is bad oh it's bad oh it's bad all right it's real bad. i love that i don't watch the office i just say quotes that you guys say all the time i have no idea the, of the context <laughs> all right consider that the uh score update please uh continue Jared. all right question six well on a brighter note what is the SI unit of luminous flux, the amount of light emitted from a source per unit of time? I am locked in, though I don't necessarily think I'm right. I'm locked in, too. I'm trying to remember if the one I'm thinking of is an SI unit. I have several of those units still saved uh, from the subscription that my mom got me of the SI unit. Right. Swimsuit edition. You're locked in, right? <laughs> I'm locked in, yeah. All right. Uh, I'm gonna Lighting say, fixtures. and. I'm going to say it's a lumen. A lumen? Um... Yeah, I didn't know what what any of that meant. Uh, initially, I, I was going to say Saluki for SIU, uh, for Southern Illinois University, but then I locked in with another Flux, the Charlize Theron starring Aeon Flux. And I also put Lumen. Hmm. You may have seen this word tossed around if you've ever looked closely while buying light bulbs. The amount of luminous flux that a standard 60-watt incandescent light bulb produces is somewhere in the ballpark of 800 lumens. So Lumen is correct. Oh, wow. I'm tanking, but I feel okay about it. All right, question seven. Now that I'm mentioning ballparks and measurements, which Major League Baseball stadium has the shortest distance to center field, coming in at 395 feet? And I'll accept team name or stadium name, although they're not all that different. And caveat, I will say the answer I'm looking for is not Fenway Park, since that one has some weird geometry, and it could be the shortest or longest, depending on how you define it. Shucks, I was going to write Fenway. This is a great question, uh, because... I used to know this, who had the shortest, because everyone would always talk about having home runs there, but then they were like, well, it is the shortest field. I was, I was looking at a graph the other day of all the baseball stadiums overlapped for like, they were all aligned at home plate, and then you could see like the different outlines of all the <clears throat> I think it's shapes. very strange that baseball is the only sport that's not so, like regulated. As far as the field size. Yeah, you think they'd all that. be one size. Because yeah. when I used to play baseball as a kid, we'd go to different fields and like the one kid would hit home runs because the field was so short, but then he'd go to like a normal size field and he would never even get close to home runs. That's run. sort of the argument totally with baseball, screw up your stats. It should. I mean, I don't know. Well, yeah, as far as like 
If you have the home field advantage of being a good slugger in a shorter field, yes, career-wise you'll have better stats. But as far as like game wins, I mean, you're playing in the same stadium. So the yeah. argument is like if if your slugger can hit a home run, but so can the away so team. So-and-so has the maximum amount of home runs or whatever. But maybe they just had a natural advantage because their home field is mm. yeah shorter. Or maybe like yeah. with... So anyways... With candlestick, um, like the wind would carry it out or whatever. Yeah. So. I'm locked in here. Is the so. Mar- are the Marlins a baseball team? They are. They are. I'm going to go with that. He said that you're locked into your I'm locked in, yeah. He said that the stadium and the team name isn't very different. Yeah. So I was trying to figure out if it was um, Yankee Stadium or maybe uh, Dodger Stadium. Mm. Um, But I went uh, Yankee Stadium. And I don't know the names of stadiums, so I said Marlins Stadium. Yeah, along with the question that Jared gave us, um, I thought of my two quantifiers where it would be an old stadium because they wouldn't have uh, elongated it so i know dodger stadium is known as dodger stadium and and it's really old so i went dodger stadium the oldest mlb stadium west of the mississippi river it is dodger stadium home of the la dodgers there we go a little logic worked out do you know do you happen to know what the largest stadium is just draw this little x on Um, my paper here so i looked at wikipedia a lot when i was writing this game and this came straight from Wikipedia table. Let me get back there. Oh yeah, uh, we can we can come back. I to think it, later. it was I think it was Fenway, but it, again, that's hmm. with that caveat that it's kind of yeah, because like the the um, right outfield is like really short, but the left outfield is massive because that's where the big wall is. Or, or I have that flipped or something like that. But no, yeah, yeah, left yeah. field is the green monster. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I love the sound of that mechanical keyboard typing. Oh, uh, Comerica Park uh, in Detroit is the longest. That's not Fenway. Oh, cool. All right, question eight. The Mississippi River is the second largest drainage system on the North American continent. What bay, sharing its name with a nearby river and a nearby strait, is the largest drainage system in North America? I'll take a guess. I was going to say, I thought uh, Jeff was getting to that age where, uh, you know, men usually get up in the middle of the night and he becomes the largest drainage system. (laughs) uh, I went with the uh, Hudson Bay. Oh, that's nice. I, I had no idea. Um, I kept thinking of the Bering Strait, but I don't even think that's in North America. Uh, so I said, I said the San Francisco Bay. Yeah, I, I oh. wondered if uh, on size it was Hudson, so I said Hudson Bay. Draining a massive one and a half million square miles of area, the largest on the continent is the Hudson Bay. Hmm. All right. All right, question nine. Rock Hudson is an actor known for many things, such as Giant, Pillow Talk, and Macmillan and Wife. But his death was especially notable because he was the first major celebrity to die from what illness? I'm locked in. Locked in. Oh, that question. I, I was lost on that question, but then I it came around to something that triggered a memory. I think he died of AIDS. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yep, died of AIDS. Yep, I said AIDS. Yeah, just a couple years after it began its prominence in the U.S., Rock Hudson died from AIDS-related complications at the age of 59. Yeah, I really pushed it uh, into the conversation in the forefront. Okay, question 10. First aid is a subject that encompasses many practices, one of the most well-known being CPR. What does CPR stand for? I'm locked in. I think I'm still certified for adults and children. <laughs> are, you, are you certified if you can't even say what it stands for? I think so. <laughs> I do, do you know, lose your certification? I don't know, but this is what I'll tell you, though. And this is what I learned, uh, speaking of Queen. If you do your compressions to the beat beats per minute of another one bites the dust uh that is the correct 110 i I believe beats per measure it's pretty negative though i know (laughs) staying alive alive is a much better one has the same bpm yeah you could do but a much more positive message i guess that's true yeah (laughs) Yeah, depending on how the cpr is going you can switch it up imagine you're standing over you're 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 you're, you're, (laughs) over somebody deal you're administering cpr and you're singing another one bites the dust and another one does and another one does and it's like how many people yeah and then the person wakes up they're like just stop singing i'm alive (laughs) um i think i'm locked in compression persistent respiration Okay. Um, I think I could be wrong. I think it is cardiac pulmonary resuscitation. There you go. I, uh, I also said some form of that. I said cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Having to do with acting as the heart and lungs for person in need, CPR stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Good job, guys. Oh, man, I feel really good about that. I don't know about you guys, but every time I do CPR on somebody, I like to do it to my favorite math rock song. So I do like five quick compressions of five and then two slower ones at two and then another set of three. 
You're just like changing the time signature. Yeah, right, right. And yeah. and BPM. You got to keep people on their toes, even if they are dying. Well, <laughs> <laughs> they're on their backs. Yeah. <laughs> they're dying. They're like, this isn't technical enough. <laughs> that would be me. I'd like to request a progressive, progressive rock, please. <laughs> you shout at the person, stop vacillating between 108 and 112. Yeah, right. <laughs> Anyways, uh, score recap for the first round. I uh, had a pretty prominent uh, performance. I'm at 80 points. How about you guys? I, I'm uh, batting uh, 50%, uh, which, you know, some of those questions were in my wheelhouse and were not, and I feel pretty good about it. So. Not bad. I was I was pulling away at the start, but you're you're creeping up on me. How about you? Yeah, after uh, missing three in a row in the first half, I ended up with 60. So All right. So uh, Ken in first place with 80, Jeff in second with 60, and Neil uh, bringing up the rear with uh, 50. 50, yeah. All right. Let's uh, go on to the swing round. Okay. The theme for this swing round is bones. For this swing round, I'm going to give you the medical name for a bone or a group of bones in the body. All you have to do, I see Jeff fist pumping there. Yeah. All you have to do is give me the common name for it or the body part most closely associated with it. Feel pretty good. And too. be as specific as you can. For instance, arm or leg will not be enough. Okay. So, one, patella. Two, ulna. Three, coxal. Four, scapula. Five, the metatarsals. Six, the vertebral column. Seven, malleus, incus, and stapes. Eight, clavicle. Nine, tibia. And ten, mandible. All right, so we're going to think about these for a couple minutes here. I see uh, Neil's actually writing on a Batman comic book today. What, what, what book is that? Uh, yeah, it's a uh, Frank Miller Batman Dark Knight Returns. You're actually a pretty big Batman fan, aren't you? I am a pretty big Batman fan. Um, you know, it's pretty funny. Uh, I've only, well, actually, I've dressed up as Batman a few different times when I was a kid. And then I, and uh, again, last week. And last week. And every yeah. night. Um, currently in studio. Currently in studio. It's pretty weird. Um, uh, well, so in college, actually, it was, uh, I believe it was, for Halloween, I think it was 2004. Yeah, because 2003, I dressed up as... Wait, Ju- is this a Neil story? I guess it would be a Neil story, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so it was 2004, because 2003, I dressed up as Justin Timberlake from the Justified album tour. And the, the way that <laughs> you... The, the way that you knew it was from the tour is I wore a fedora and a jean jacket. Um, so yeah, so I was Justin Timberlake 2003. So 2004, um, I was Batman. And... Uh, uh, this this story is going to revolve around Peter Pit a little bit because you guys know how much I like Peter Pit. A lot of great stories. Uh, but uh, I dressed up as Batman and it was a kid's costume. It was a very tight uh, toddler costume. That's why I wore it. And um, I put it on and it looked really pretty ridiculous. And all the people on my, my floor were saying, oh, you know, it'd be funny. You should put a bunch of socks in the tight pants of the Batman outfit and you'll have a Batman bulge. So I did it. Wait, you didn't already have that from wearing a toddler size costume? Well, it, it was just expanded. So we put a bunch of uh, socks down there. Did you have the bat nipples? It did. It was the Batman Beyond costume, mm. which is black with the red. And, uh, so no nipples. So no nipples. So we put a bunch of socks in there. We went down up and down the floor. All the people on the floor took pictures because they were all wasted already and they were, you know, poking the bulge. And uh, we, we went out to a party. Uh, went to a house party and I hadn't really uh, had alcohol because I didn't like the taste of beer. So I get to the door and the guy is in a tux and he said, what do you want to drink? And I said, I don't drink beer. And he said, all right, well, uh, I have Captain Morgan. And I said, okay, well, just give me something so it doesn't look like I'm not drinking. So he gave me a full ro- uh, red solo cup full of Captain Morgan. Oh, that'll get the job done. And I'd never had it before. And I was like, I guess I'd just drink it straight because what, what's it going to do, right? So I drank it in about 20 minutes. And uh, I was just, uh, you know, in, in inebriated beyond compare. And uh, I was, you know, walking around this party dressed as Batman. And I went to the basement and my friend was dressed as Minnie Mouse. And she was in the bathroom. She said, come to the bathroom because you drank too much. So we're both in the bathroom at the same time. And like a little kid, because I was dressed as a little kid and I was drunk, I just completely pulled my pants down, went to the bathroom. And I said, oh, great. I feel better now. Somebody so, arrest this man. I, uh, so, I, so I got dressed again. And we leave the party. It's about 1 a.m. And uh, it's me, Minnie Mouse, and a deviled egg. And we're, we're walking <laughs> down the street. And all of a sudden, these... Uh, that old joke. That old joke. These uh, people come up. It was a guy dressed as the Trix Rabbit. And another guy dressed as a serial killer, quote unquote. He's a big cereal box with knives. 
So they come up and my friend goes, hey, Batman's here. He's got a Batman bulge. You have to touch it. Everyone's been touching it, taking pictures. The one guy goes, Batman bulge. And then he punches me as hard as he can in the crotch. <laughs> and if you remember, when I went to the bathroom like a little kid, I dropped my pants. So all of the socks are now not in my pants. So he hits me straight in the crotch. <laughs> so you lost all your padding. I lost all my padding. I was on the floor, almost threw up. My friends decided it wasn't worth waiting for me. So they left. And I said, the only thing that's going to make me feel better is to get pee to pit. So I went to pee to pit college fast casual place uh blacked out all i remember is there was a sumo wrestler behind the counter taking my order i b- blacked out again i woke up about 3 a.m and i was eating a pita no joke 100 percent true with someone dressed as Catwoman across from me and we both kind of nodded and ate our pitas in silence knowing what the situation was and enjoyed it so there you Good go job, neil a lot more details there but i had to <laughs> it's the most ridiculous story <laughs> Oh, got to dig deep for these Neil stories these days, huh? I know. A lot of details, but I got to <laughs> make them somewhat PG. All right. Well, with that, I think we've had enough time to think about these answers and think about our life choices. <laughs> 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 so let's uh, let's go ahead and recap the swing round and we'll give our answers. All right. Sure. Uh, number one was patella. So for that one, I said kneecap. Yep. I said knee. Yep. I said kneecap. Yeah, that's, that's right. Cool. Uh, number two, ulna. So I've broken this. Uh, it is the uh, forearm. Ooh, I said wrist. Um, I have not broken this, but I do get golfer's elbow, which is golfer's when you, elbow when you pinch the nerve, uh, the ulnar nerve, which is the outside of your forearm. So hmm. forearm is right. Number three was coxal. Yeah, I thought this was the same as the coccyx, so I said tailbone, but maybe I'm wrong. I thought the same thing, so I said tailbone as well. I'm pretty sure it wasn't the tailbone, but I guess something close, so I said maybe it's the name for the pelvis. Pelvis it's, is the name yeah, for the, the pelvis. Yeah, the hip bone or pelvis. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. So so basically when you want to like shake your... No, shake your coccyx would be shake your tail feather, but shake your coxal would be shake your hips. Yeah. Okay. The uh, Shakira's coxal don't lie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that was the original title. All right, number four, scapula. That is uh, like the the wing on your back. What, what, what would you call it? I would call it your shoulder. Your shoulder. Yeah, I said shoulder. the shoulder but blade. But it's not really the shoulder blade. I said shoulder blade. Yeah, it's your shoulder blade. That's right, shoulder blade. <laughs> I said it the worst way. <laughs> the wing, what your wing is. It's your wing, you know, if you were meat, <laughs> that would be the wing. If it was detachable, yes. I'll, I'll eat your wing. They call it the wing, the back wing. <laughs> Back shoulder blade uh, all right number five i'm giving myself credit uh metatarsals uh that's your foot yeah i said foot yeah they're the i think those are the mid bones in your foot yep uh number six the vertebral column i went general here and i just said spine i see yeah, i said spine as well uh, i said spinal column that's right yeah spine number seven malleus incus and stapes so those are the ear bones, I believe. I think they're commonly called the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. Oh, I should have went that way. I thought Malleus, Incus, and Stapes were all members of Slytherin. Um, <laughs> I just put fingers. Uh, no, those are the three bones that make the inner ear. Yeah, Ken and Jeff nailed it there. Oh, well, that cereal guy hit hit my Malleus, Incus, and Stapes very hard. <laughs> Is that what you call them? <laughs> yeah. Number eight, you guys were talking about this one a lot, so I think you got it. Uh, the clavicle. Yeah, great song by Alkaline Trio. Uh, that's your collarbone. Yeah, broken uh, clavicle brought to you by Cleo Mack, uh, Aaron Rodgers. That would be uh, clavicle. Yeah, I broke mine um, rather severely, cracked about three inches off in eighth grade. So I will never forget that's the collarbone. All right. Number nine, tibia. Uh, this, I believe, is uh, basically in your lower leg. So I put shin. I also said shin. Yeah, it's the one on the front. So I said shin. Yep, it's the shin bone. And number 10, the mandible. And that is the jaw, because we all suffer from bruxism here. Yep, we do. Jaw. Good solid place for punching a lad. The jaw. You guys did really, really good on that round. Congratulations. Cool. So 45 points for me on that. I had 35 points. And I had my first ever perfect swing round. Nice. Unless I already had one and forgot. We're like 100 episodes in. I don't yeah, know anymore. who knows? <laughs> so that brings me to 125. Neil? I'm at my birth year, 85. And I am up to 110. All right. So Jeff's creeping up on me here. I got to keep an eye on him. Let's go into round two. All right. Round two, question one. After that swing round, anyone down from a game of bones? 
<laughs> in a standard double six dominoes set, if you were to count up all the dots on all the tiles, what would the total be? And I'll give you a lenience of plus or minus two. I let's, don't, let's I don't know pick. dominoes. I'm just gonna pick a lucky number on this one. So consider me locked in. All right, yeah, I'm locked in. I, I, it's probably very incorrect. I know Ken's gonna give me uh, a look for asking for this again because I have no idea what it is. But can I hear that again? Tell you what, Jeff. If you get this question right, I'll give you ten dollars. Nice. Ooh, I'm nice. a witness. I'm a witness. Or I'll buy you lunch today. All right, I'm gonna take a guess. What is it? Fifty-seven. Okay, I just said seventy-two. I think you guys are pretty low, uh, but I don't know. <laughs> I just picked a nice round number, three sixty. Okay, there are a total of one hundred sixty-eight dots on all the tiles. <laughs> wow! So now you owe me ten dollars. That's not even <laughs> correct. <laughs> it's on recording. <laughs> Roll the tape. Just kidding. Go ahead, number two. Question two. Flipping back my calendar to the year 168, I can see that a man named Cao Rin was born. Cao Rin would grow up to become a military general and play a significant part in what country's Three Kingdoms period? I took an educated guess, so feel free to talk it out. Three Kingdoms. I'm locked in. You're locked in. You know, I'm just thinking, just throwing out Rome and Ottoman Empire, China. Did China have Three Kingdoms? Maybe it did. I don't know. I'm just going to go with uh, China. Yeah, I was thinking about China, but uh, Jeff didn't seem to lock in fast. He knows a lot about Chinese history. And the name didn't ring especially Chinese to me. So I said Mongolia, mm. but I don't know. I think Ren means man in Chinese. Um, but uh, part of my familiarity with China is much earlier. Uh, the Warring States period was about five or 600 years before that. Mm-hmm. So, um, But yeah, I my early... This millennia or that millennia of Chinese history, not good, but uh, I figured from the name it had to be China, and also they tended to name periods like that. So, the Three Kingdoms period began with the end of the Han Dynasty in China. Oh, yeah. I overthought it, guys. I'm fading, fading fast. <laughs> Question three China holds the record for many things, one of which being the country that shares its border with the most amount of neighbors, that number of neighbors being 14. With seven guesses, can you name six of those countries? Yeah, I'm locked in. <laughs> okay, so after a little thinking about that, I came up with a list of seven. Uh, I'm going to go with Mongolia, Russia, North Korea, South Korea, Nepal, Vietnam, and Pakistan. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't sure. I went North Korea, Vietnam, Russia, Philippines, Turkey, Singapore, and Thailand. So, uh, yeah, given Mongolia, I think, is the longest border, and I know I think Afghanistan is the shortest border. I said those two, and I also said North Korea, India, Nepal, and Russia. Okay. Russia comes in second place with 13 neighboring countries, but China borders the most, including Afghanistan, Bhutan, India, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Laos, Mongolia, Myanmar, Nepal, North Korea, Pakistan, Russia, Tajikistan, and Vietnam. Wow, that was way oh, off. Oh, I got it. Yeah, South Korea is wrong because it's... I snuck it in. Yeah, yeah I, thought, I thought so, but I, I figured I'd get an extra guess. Oh, I snuck it in. Question four. As a kid, you might have heard that if you start digging in your sandbox, you would eventually come out on the other side of the earth in the middle of China. In reality, if you started somewhere in America and drilled straight down, you'd actually more than likely end up in the middle of the Indian Ocean. What is the term for two points on the globe that are exact geographic opposites? I'm locked in. I'm I'm locked in. I don't think I'm right here, but I'm just gonna say um, polar opposite. Hmm. I just said it's not really a pole, but yeah, I I had no idea. I just said perfect strangers. You were closer than you think, Ken. The correct term is antipode. Hmm. Yeah, if two sets of coordinates on a globe are exact opposites, then they are called antipodes. Question five: Anti, anti. I'm having trouble remembering the name of the type of medicine that assists in reducing symptoms caused by common allergies. Could someone remind me? Are you guys on these right now? Yeah. Yes. I am not, <laughs> but uh, I think it's antihistamine. I went antihistamine. I said antihistamine. The name of the type of drug that I personally use on the reg is called an antihistamine. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I've got too many and varied allergies to not almost always be on it. So It is rough down here in the South. Yeah, it's getting rough up here too. So I'm sure. All right, that brings me to uh, 145 after five questions in uh, round two. Yep, uh, I'm up to only 105, so still far behind. Jeff? I have 150. Uh, You son of a gun. All right, question six. 
Over the years, video games have encompassed virtually every genre of fiction imaginable, but games set in medical dramas are definitely on the rarer side. There is at least one notable series, named after a type of hospital, with titles such as Under the Knife for the Nintendo DS and Second Opinion for the Wii, that was popular in the mid-2000s. Can you name this series? Are these the games we played with the hands doing surgery or no? Um, it's possible. Or that's probably, that was we, I think, right? I just, I have a guess. I, I, locked, I locked in a joke. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. That hopefully is right. All right. I'm locked. Uh, I just went with ICU. All right. I'm just going to lock in with surgery simulator. Hmm. Um, I remember somebody uh, had made fun of this game way back in the day where it was basically like um, super busy hospital. So I said super busy hospital. <laughs> Pretty good guesses. Uh, the series in question that is also the name of a kind of a hospital is called Trauma Center. Oh, that makes a lot more sense. I should have worked on that angle. My, yeah. my score is getting into trauma territory, that's for sure. <laughs> Neil, these stabilizer will bleed line. out. <laughs> Someone. I remember that series pretty well because that was the last uh, game that I rented from a blockbuster before it just shut down. Okay, question seven. Nintendo's DS and Wii were two of the company's best-selling consoles of all time, the DS in particular coming very close to being the most sold console of all time, but not quite taking the lead from which console that is estimated to have sold over 155 million units. I think I know this one. I always think I know this one. I, I always think I do too, but I, I'm going to lock in just off the gut gut check. I'm really into these like animated graphs Yeah, <clears throat> lately. Oh yeah, um, where they take... I just watched this one too. I'm oh, mad. Where, where things are like overtaking each but, other. But I'm, right. lo- but I'm locked in. My favorite one is the Game of Thrones on screen time, like through all Ooh, the seasons, which is kind of fun. And you That'd can really... Yeah, you, you, as most? you... Uh, Jon Snow, uh, but th- this was only okay, through season seven, and he like barely took over for Amelia Clark. Um, yeah, I'm down to two, and I, I I'm gonna pull the trigger on one. So uh, yeah, I'm locked in with uh, PS2. Yeah, my gut reaction. I always remember PS2 being on the top of lists, and without thinking about it, I locked in with PlayStation Two. I couldn't remember if it was PS2 or Game Boy because I know Game Boy sold a bunch, so I said Game Boy. Might be Game Boy. The DS sold just under a million units shy of the PlayStation 2. Ooh. Ken Reed takes the lead. If you were looking at one of those uh, video graphs, you know, you'd see me just overtake. You guys right are just there. going back and forth. Right. Question eight. The PlayStation brand is far from the only success Sony has seen over the years. Back in the mid-2000s, Sony found itself in a battle for dominance on the digital home video market, eventually succeeding in passing what product with their own Blu-ray technology? Locked in. Locked in. And some might say, very, very specifically our friend Ryan, that this technology that it passed is far superior to the Blu-ray, even though it is completely gone. And Didn't right. it have worse video quality, though? Uh, I think it's it just had the, It just didn't have the weird interlacing problem that Blu-ray has sometimes? No, Blu-ray didn't have an interlacing problem. That was on the... That's all TV. That was on the TV side? I think a lot of it was just licensing and, and what studios they just ended up going with sony probably because it was a studio rather than or was he just more excited about the fact that you could get more adult things on this, <laughs> this problem <medium? laughs> i think ryan just liked the red cases instead of the blue cases yeah i think we're all circling the same answer here which i locked in with hd dvd yep same here i remember you could get it as an attachment for your xbox 360 i said hd dvd last thing from 2006 to early 2008 the bloodless high definition optical disc format war ended when toshiba announced that they would stop manufacturing their hd dvd players r.i.p i remember the big argument was like people thought hd dvd on the same logic as vhs would take over because like beta died out and it was a mm-hmm. like a better format like blu-ray was well but... it was pretty much the same you know it's just yeah marketing i guess question nine <laughs> It's hard to say whether we would have had access to all of Japan's technological innovations if a certain U.S. Commodore hadn't played an important role in ending, ending Japan's isolationist policies and opening up trade with them. Most of the heavy lifting of this effort took place in early 1854 when he showed up with eight warships and asserted that he would not leave until Japan signed a treaty. Who was this man who helped us become friends of sorts with Japan? Locked in. Wow. Was this a movie or no? You don't have it's, to tell me, it's but... It's been featured in different stuff. But. Like that character? <laughs> Jeff is dead <laughs> in the studio. Jeff is very upset, and I know exactly why. He's upset because he currently can't remember with certitude what the answer is. <laughs> but he's, he should know it. He's a Commodore, right? Mm-hmm. So he's not a modern major general. <laughs> um, <laughs> Commodore. 
One of my favorite songs from Pirates of Penzance. And probably the only song from Pirates of Penzance that you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm locked in. Ugh. I feel like I'm going to know it when I hear it. It's not Nathan Algren, who was no. the character Tom Cruise played in Last Samurai. That is correct. <laughs> As, I'm hoping to remember, so I'm going to talk about this anyways. But there's a <clears throat> funny episode at the end of one of my favorite series, Samurai Champloo. It's an anime. Um, where the Americans come basically to do the treaty and their version of this is they do like a really hilarious baseball game which is you know it's in like an 1880s japan era oh, okay setting but it's just it's just the most ridiculous thing i, I kind of realized that that show takes place over like a 200 year span of history it, it does, due yeah. to the anachronisms which is kind of interesting fun yeah i've got a name in my head that i can't get out and i just don't know if it's right but i'll lock it in i'll start with my incorrect answer i just went with pinafore from the HMS Pinafore. I think you got the right letter. Yeah, this is not the guy who stars in Friends, uh, but I went with <laughs> Perry. I, too, went Commodore Perry. Yeah, this man was not exactly a Chandler being, but he was a Matthew Perry. <laughs> um, I also want to plug another great video, which is The History of Japan by Bill Wirtz, because um, there's a very funny like uh, scene where they talk about the Americans coming to trade. Hmm. They have boats with guns. And that was the end of Gun the, uh, <laughs> the uh, Dutch... Uh, Ex- what's it called dutch uh, yeah they had like an exclusionary period exclusionary but they only period. really traded at like a couple distinct ports it was yeah. a very restricted but yeah in uh question number 10 in the book of matthew and the bible it is said that judas iscariot conspired against jesus and handed him over for a sum of money what was he paid for doing this i'm locked in although uh, i don't remember if too. i have the right the right ransom amount yeah <laughs> Or if this was a different biblical story that I'm confusing. I know I've heard this. I know it's like not a lot of money or whatever, I think, because they're always like, Jesus was worth more than two shillings or whatever. Um, <laughs> but, two, two pounds sterling. Uh, but for some reason, all I could get out, uh, all I couldn't get out of my head was um, was the British currency. And, uh, and I just said that he traded over his life for seven pounds of either flesh or pounds, British pounds. Isn't that the Will Smith movie? Yes. Uh, I said 40 pieces of silver. Yeah, I couldn't remember the uh, amount. I thought it was either 20 pieces of silver or 30 pieces of silver, and I went with 20 pieces. The chief priest agreed to pay Judas 30 pieces of silver uh, for betraying Jesus. And by today's estimates, that's only about 200 bucks. You're right. It's a hmm. very small amount. At the end of that round and regulation, seems I've crawled my way up to 175. How about you, Jeff? Uh, I had the lead for a brief moment and I'm back down 170. Yeah, I'm far behind at uh, 125. All right, let's go into the final round and get the final round categories. All right, categories in today's final round are soap operas, Shakespeare, mythology, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and NFL. All right, seems all the wagers are locked in now, so let's get the questions. All right, question one in the category of soap operas. General Hospital has been on the air since April 1st, 1963, racking up numerous TV records, including 13 Daytime Emmy Awards and its incredibly long run. As of today, can you name the total number of episodes aired of General Hospital, rounded to the nearest thousand? Question two in the category of Shakespeare. In one of his plays, the antagonist convinces his wife to steal a treasured item from the protagonist's wife. The item was a handkerchief patterned with strawberries. What play is this, and can you name two of those four characters I just mentioned? Question three in the category of mythology. Hermes, the messenger of the gods in Greek mythology, is almost always pictured wearing a certain kind of sandals called telaria. What is the defining feature of telaria? Question four in the category of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The MCU is a shared universe between dozens of TV shows and films and features some characters across a large number of them. Which character has had the most screen time by a very wide margin? And I can accept the actor's name as well. Question five in the category of NFL. In the 2018-2019 regular football season, Ben Roethlisberger threw the most for a total of 51-29 yards. Ezekiel Elliott rushed the most for a total of 14-34 yards. But who, with a total of 1677 yards, received for the most? All right, so we're going to think about these uh, great questions for a couple minutes here. And uh, Neil, you had something to say about the Patreon? 
Uh, yeah, so Patreon, um, you know, we're going to be pulling names for Bloodsport. Uh, as of this recording, we're actually going to pull them today. So we have Bloodsport coming up, which is great. But if you want to be a guest host like Jared uh, was for us today and a great guest host at that, um, there are some Google forms you can find in the crop. So make sure that you're a member of our private Facebook group, the crop. There's two forms under the announcement page. There's a guest host uh, page, uh, sign up form, and then the guest contestant page. So trying to work our way throughout all of the the list there. We're getting our way through the contestant page, but uh, we've had all of our guest hosts, uh, people who have signed up. I think everyone has almost hosted at least once. So we'll, we'll go back to the well and people can host again. But if you'd like to host, sign up there and, and we'll get a notification. And once we need people, when we schedule, we'll go through it. Um, and a lot of those people are Patreon members. So Jeff, how can people uh, sign up to be a Patreon member to get exclusive um what did we say? They, they get, uh, not first choice, but they're looked at first, at least, as far as coming on the show. Our patrons are um, the support of the show, and, and so we'd like to give back as much as we can, including the bonus episodes and all the other wonderful perks that we have there. But also, yes, we do give priority um, for hosting and being on the show uh, to patrons. We only think that's fair. They help and support us. We would like to help and support them by getting them onto the show. And if you'd like to join uh, Jared in supporting the show, if, if every week you download the show and you're, we're the first ones you want to listen to, um, your support would mean a lot to us and you can do so at patreon.com slash triviality podcast. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. And I think we're all locked in here. So let's go ahead and get the uh, questions reread. We'll give our answers and find out how poorly we did. Okay. Uh, question one in the category of soap operas. I asked you, can you name the total number of episodes aired of General Hospital rounded to the nearest thousand? Well, for me, I wagered zero. So I just wrote 6,000. I think that's low, but I don't care. Uh, I went really big in this final round. Uh, soap operas. My mom loved soap operas. I used to watch them all the time when I was a kid. Uh, we watched One Life to Live, All My Children, and uh, General Hospital. So I'm going to give you my reasoning here. Um, soap operas are basically on all year. They don't take breaks. A lot. Of, they don't get a lot of credit for the type of actors they are. They memorize a lot of dialogue. They shoot a lot in one day. And um, basically my math was uh, five episodes a week, brand new episodes for 52 weeks of the year with hardly any breaks. Uh, so I did 5 times 52, which was 250. And then I took 250 times 54 years from 1965, which I had the wrong, incorrect year. So we'll see how my math checks out. But 1965 to now, which led me to 13,500 episodes. So that's my guess for 30 points. Yep. Knowing the start date, roughly one a week. I didn't even think about um, only five days a week or whatever. So I just it was like about 14,000. But I wagered nothing. So. Okay. Well, according to IMDb, at the time of writing this question, General Hospital has aired 14,340 episodes. So 14,000 would have been the correct answer there. All right. Question two in the category of Shakespeare. In one of his plays, the antagonist convinces his wife to steal a treasured item from the protagonist's wife. The item was a handkerchief patterned with strawberries. What play is this? And can you name two of those four characters that I mentioned? The four characters being the antagonist, the protagonist, and their respective wives. Yeah, so this one I wagered 20 on for some reason. Explain that to me, I don't know. But uh, I thought, this didn't sound too familiar to me, but uh, I thought about what characters I was going to be able to name. And I remembered uh, Othello had sort of a uh, infidelity thing to it. So maybe they were trying to plant the handkerchief on somebody. And I said Othello and Desdemona. Yeah, um, Othello was the only one I could think of that had like a quartet of two couples. So uh, I wagered nothing, but I guessed Othello and I had Othello and Desdemona. Yeah, so the play is Othello. And uh, I wrote uh, Othello and Desdemona. I could have said Iago and I can never remember uh, the other character, but I went Othello. Her, her name ends That's with like as far as I got right? to. Yeah. What did you say? Her name ends with like an A or something, doesn't it? Yeah, I never remember that one. But yeah, Othello with Desdemona. Yeah, you guys nailed it. Uh, in Shakespeare's play, Othello... Iago asks his wife, Amelia, to steal Desdemona's strawberry handkerchief in order to cause Othello to begin doubting his wife's faithfulness. Yeah, I had to dig deep on that for that uh, 20 points there. And I wagered another big 30 points. Nice. Okay. All right. Question three in the category of mythology. Hermes, the messenger of the gods in Greek mythology, is always pictured wearing a certain kind of sandals called Teleria. What is the defining feature of Teleria? Uh, yeah, I think uh, you're looking for the wings that are on the heel there, and I wagered 30 points. Okay, I wagered 10 because I'm not all the way through Misinformation's uh, mythology um, 
bulk of episodes. But uh, I was just looking at Paul Schaefer from the Disney movie Hercules, and he had wings on his sandals, so I said wings. I got confused. I wagered 10. I thought these were Hermes sandals, so I thought they had the big <laughs> H on them. Uh, no, I thought maybe they all had to be uh, thongs, so I said thong sandals. All right. Uh, Teleria are what the Greeks called Hermes's winged sandals. Oh, wait, are those called thongs, those sandals? The ones with your toes split in the front, yeah. Jeff just had Cisco on the mind, I think. I, I, like, when you said that, I was I literally pictured thongs, and I was like, wait a minute, that's not Greek, but okay. Sorry. That's, that's not, not Greek. That's not Greek. <laughs> that's All right, it. question four in the category of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, I asked you to name the character or actor who has spent the most amount of screen time. Yeah, so I wagered big on this one, 30. Uh, initially, I was thinking... Iron Man, because I think he had the most and longest film appearances, but you had mentioned the TV shows as well. Um, there are Netflix series featuring, so, you know, solo characters, but uh, they split their screen time up quite a bit. And I know Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has been on for like six seasons or something now mm -hmm. that features the character Agent Coulson, which also has some screen time in the movies. I hope he has the most screen time in that show. Uh, I think it would be a hard... Uh, if it was like uh, Daisy or somebody like that, you know, one of the minor characters in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So for 30 points, Agent Coulson, played by Clark Gregg. Uh, I went uh, in with 15. Yeah, I was between Agent Coulson because uh, he has so little time in the films. I mean, he's kind of a cameo. And then Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which makes sense. But I just sort of went with the bedrock of the franchise. And I figured Downey Jr. had three of his own movies, plus all the Avengers films, plus all the cameos, Homecoming and whatnot. So I just figured I'd hedge my bets on uh, Downey Jr. I, I wagered 20 myself. I, I based this decision on um, TV time runs up a lot faster than movie time. And I figured who's in the TV shows and the movies. And so I immediately went to Clark Gregg as Agent Coulson. Yeah, I think uh, RDJ has the most amount of movies appeared in. But thanks to his starring role in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., actor Clark Gregg portraying Agent Phil Coulson has had the most screen time in the MCU by quite a bit, appearing in over 100 episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and five yeah. films and a few shorts here and there. Yeah. All right, question five in the category of NFL. In the 2018-2019 regular football season, who received the most amount of yards with 1677? For zero points, it's got to be Kevin Sorbo. <laughs> Hercules himself. Uh, I wagered 15. I was between Antonio Brown and Julio Jones. Uh, I thought Matt Ryan throws a lot. Julio Jones uh, is kind of the only person that catches a lot of the balls on that team. Um, but I figured Ben Roethlisberger threw them up the most for that year. And who does he throw it to the most? Antonio Brown. So that's why I went with. Throw it to the most. I wagered 10 and I said the only receiver on that team, Antonio Brown. Leading the pack by more than 100 yards over second place wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins. Julio Jones received the most last season. Damn. I always thought the team that liked to spread it around was the Saints. I didn't realize Roethlisberger was thrown to that many well, anytime targets. Anytime you're, uh, you're on Bourbon Street after 1 a.m., there's a lot of things getting spread around. I did great on that last round. Ooh. Man, that's a big score. We're a big boy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Neil, for that lead-in. Um, yeah, we were just adding up the points here, and it uh, looks like uh, Neil... Gain a few points in that final round. 165. Good job. Mm -hmm. Admirable effort. Respectable. Uh, Jeff, you uh, bottomed out and you just uh, kind of stayed the, at the same score, right? Yeah, I didn't I didn't venture enough in the front and then I, I washed out in the end. So I 170 going in, 170. 170 coming out. And as Neil said, a big score for a big boy. 255 for me. Wow. Today's cream of the crop. On balance, off balance, doesn't matter. I'm better than you are, yeah. Well done. Well done. Yeah, thank you. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, great game, great theme going throughout the game, question to question, and um, a lot of insider trading there. Like you knew the game, <laughs> not insider trading. I <laughs> uh, thanks. I, I had a lot of fun writing this. I hope I can do it sometime in the future. Yeah, definitely. Those were those were great questions. I had a, and good level of difficulty. I, I like getting thank questions you. right on occasion. Yeah, yeah. No, they were <laughs> they were in some great different uh, difficulty levels there and uh, all over the board. So yeah, a lot of fun. Thank you. Uh, anyone you'd like to give a shout out to or any uh, any last words from you uh, over there in Alabama? Uh, it's my friend Laura's birthday. So happy birthday, Laura. Happy birthday. Going out to you, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Dedicated uh, yeah. to Laura. All right. And roll tide or whatever that is, you know, 
Is that Alabama? Oh, I went to Auburn, so. Ooh, so now definitely we're, not we're big time. rivals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what are, what sports? Uh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go Bo Jackson, right? Auburn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> well, thank you everybody you... for uh, for listening. Thank you to Jared for that great game, and thank you for his continued support. Uh, for Jeff, Neil, Matt, wherever he is, I am Ken, and that was Triviality. Ryan also loves DVHS, <laughs> which is like a big, thick VHS tape. He forced us to watch one of those one time. Yeah, he loves dead formats. Just anything that's dead. Latin. Latin. Loves it. Yep. Scrolls.